and give them warning from me. So I want you to notice a couple of things that God says unto Ezekiel there. Number one, he says, I am the promise that you promised me. You know, and this is the gospel. This is an unconditional promise. They preach the gospel to people. They start a church, and then that church starts preaching the gospel. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And give them warning from me. So I want you to notice a couple of things that God says unto Ezekiel there. Number one, he says, I am the promise that you promised me. You know, and this is the gospel. This is an unconditional promise. They preach the gospel to people. They start a church. And then that church starts preaching the gospel. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Amen. Amen. Of course, here we have the famous story of the 12 spies that are sent forth, one from each tribe of the children of Israel. They're sent forth to spy out the land of Canaan. I want to pick up here towards the end of the story, really, the end of the chapter, when they begin to start to speak of this. I want you to look in verse number 25. It says this first, and they returned from searching of the land, from searching of the land after 40 days. Verse 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, <clears throat> We came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, <coughs> excuse me, and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Verse number 31. <clears throat> but the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. <clears throat> Verse 33, And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now I want you to keep reading here in chapter number 14, verse number 1. It says this, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. <clears throat> and Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Verse number 9. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. The title of the sermon this morning is strengthening the hands of your brethren. Strengthening the hands of your brethren. I'm going to be preaching on the subject of provoking one another to good works. Provoking one another to good works. Encouraging your brethren. And also I'm going to be preaching a lot of the sermon 
towards the negative. And like we see in this case, not discouraging your brethren. Not discouraging your brethren. Now when we look at this story of what takes place, from the beginning, of course, we have Moses as the captain. He is the top leader. He sends forth 12 men, right? He sends forth 12 men one of each of the tribes of the children of Israel, their purpose is to spy out the land. That is their purpose. They all 12 go into the land and they successfully are able to return. They bring back sustenance from the land to show, hey, this is a good land. What the Lord said was true. There's milk, there's honey. Look at the size of the clusters of grapes that we brought back. So it is a good land, right? Then we see when they get back that 10 of the spies are doing what? They're discouraging the people. That's how it begins. They begin to discourage the people. First, they, be, they start off talking about, look at all the great things that we have. Look at all the great things that came out of this land. Let me tell you about the good report as far as the land goes, as far as the topography and the landscape and all of the resources that are there. But then they stop, and then they go into a bad report. Then they go into explaining, hey, the walls are high, though. The walls are very high. And the people are great. The people are huge. They go into explaining how the annex are there, which are who? It's the giants. And they, and they just point blank say, very, very plainly they say, we are not able to defeat them. We are not able to do this. And what happens in Numbers 13 there at the end, it says that Caleb stilled the people. He, he kind of starts to gather control, doesn't he? When, he? when it says he stilled the people, it's because everyone's starting to become frantic. Everyone's starting to panic at this point. They're scared. They've been traveling through the wilderness. They left their home in, in Egypt. They were slaves, albeit it was their home. A lot of them wanted to return even while they were traveling through wil the wilderness. Now they get to the point of where they're supposed to arrive, the land that they were promised by God and they have this bad report. So Caleb tries to get control of everything. He stands up and he tries to be a leader and he tries to calm the people. And what does he say? He explains, hey, yeah, they're big, they're strong, but we are able to overcome them. We are able to defeat them. Of course, then we see that the, the other 10 tribes, again, start to discourage the people. So we have a positive example here within Caleb of encouraging the people. But then we also have this negative example of the other 10 tribes where they are discouraging all of the troops. They are discouraging all of the people of the children of Israel. It begins there in Numbers chapter number 14. It says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. For what reason? Because of the discouragement that was given to them from the ten tribes. That is the, the outcome of that particular discouragement that came from them. Not only that, if we were to keep reading down through here, <coughs> why don't you look at verse 10 again? now. We, we stopped there in verse 9. Look at verse 10 where we see further the reaction of the people. It says, But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. That is referring to Joshua and Caleb. Those that are saying, hey, we can do this. After he just got done explaining, hey, these people are going to be bread for us. You know what he's saying? He's saying we are going to eat them. You ever heard people say, like, I will eat you alive. That's what he's saying. I will eat. We could eat this people. He's saying we could destroy them. We could go in there easily and destroy them. And he even says to them repeatedly, look right there at the end. After he says, for they are bread for us, he says, their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. And then he ends with this. Fear them not. So what is he attempting to do? He's trying to encourage the people. He, he, they've been discouraged. And he is trying to encourage. He is trying to strengthen their hands. Look at verse 10. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. You know what that means? That God is getting ready to appear. He has something to say now. This is what would happen when God would speak with Moses. Look at verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, Look at what he says next. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. He's speaking to Moses. At this point, he's threatening to just destroy all of the nation of Israel. Now, I want you to stop. If we just rewind real quick, after we see the possible punishment that God is, is threatening to pour out upon the nation of Israel, 
Where did this come from? What was the purpose? From the discouragement. From the discouragement of the ten tribes. Now they were sent forth, right? The twelve tribes were sent forth and they came back with the good report and they said, hey, look at all of the resources that we have. But there's a problem. We're not going to be able to defeat these people. We're not going to be able to overcome the annex. And what happened? As a result, they started to scream and to cry out, right? They started to lift up their voice and it said that they were weeping. We see then that Joshua and Caleb stand up to the people and they try their best to try to encourage the people and try to strengthen their hands for the battle. But it doesn't help any. And then God comes down as a result because now the people have made their decision. Now the people have conclusively decided, hey, we're going to stone Joshua, Caleb, Moses, Aaron, all of them. All the people basically that were on the Lord's side that believe the Lord. And we're just going to get another captain. We're just going to go back to Egypt. We would rather be in Egypt like they had said before. God comes down and he says... I'm going to smite them with the pestilence. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Now, of course, if you've read this story and you're familiar with the history of the Old Testament, in Israel, that doesn't happen. But do you know what does happen? They end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years as a result of this. If we go back to... I, I want you to understand the powerful effect and the profoundness of this passage. If we go back to the deciding factor of why the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, what was it? It was the discouragement from other brethren. It was the discouragement that was brought. Now, let me ask you this question. Could the Lord have brought a victory to the nation of Israel? 100%. But what was the problem? 10 people, just 10 men came back with a, with a bad report because they were discouraging the rest of the nation of Israel. So that, sh that alone should allow you to understand or should help you to understand the power that one brother has in encouraging or discouraging another brother. Not only one brother to another brother, but just one individual. You have ten men. The power that ten men were able to have over an entire nation. How much more can one man in this room encourage or discourage every other person of 40, 50 people? Greatly. I want you to turn now to Deuteronomy chapter number 20, verse number 1. Deuteronomy chapter number 20, verse number 1. The very next book to the right in your Bible, Deuteronomy chapter number 20, verse number 1. <coughs> <coughs> So the result of these ten spies discouraging the people was that the whole nation of Israel virtually, many of the nation of Israel did not believe in the Lord. They lacked faith in the Lord because of these men. They didn't do the works that they were supposed to do. They didn't go forth in battle and fight the fight because of the discouragement of these ten men. They received a punishment from God. It could have, it could have been, if we look at God's threatened, or God's, God threatening what he was threatening to do, it could have been just utter destruction of the entire nation of Israel. Of course, we know that Moses uh, uh, there played the part of like a mediator. That's when he makes the statement at, at the latter portion of that chapter, you know, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Right? So he mediates for them. But we see the great consequences of the discouragement of just ten men upon the entire nation of Israel. I want you to look here at Deuteronomy chapter number 20. This is where the law is given and God gives a lot of practical advice to the nation of Israel even in regards to war, uh, to going forth and fighting and that's what this is about here. We're going to see you know, God's advice and God's even commandments when going forth of who should fight and when they should fight and things along that line. Also in regards to encouragement of the troops. Encouragement of the troops. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 20 verse number 1. <clears throat> it says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not, and do not tremble. 
neither be ye terrified because of them. Now I want you to notice how he starts out immediately. He says, this is what I want you, speaking unto the leader here, Moses, and would later be Joshua, this is what I want you to say unto the people when you get there. And he tells them, hear, O Israel, he says, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies, let not your hearts faint. Fear not and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Verse 5, now watch this. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. <clears throat> Verse 6, And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard, and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. Verse 7, And what man is there that hath betrothed the wife, and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. Now look at verse 8, And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted. So he's speaking unto all the people. The officer is standing before the people and they yell out and this is what they're saying to everyone, to all of the troops, to all of the warriors. Let him go and return unto his house lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Now I want you to notice the commandment that is given unto the officer and what he is, the message that he is supposed to convey unto the people. He's meant to stand forward in front of all of the nation of Israel and to yell out and to say, What man is there that is fearful and faint hearted? He's saying, Is there anyone here that is afraid? Which one of you is afraid? They're standing right now. They are embarking on battle. They're going to be going forth into a real fight momentarily. And this is what's supposed to happen directly before that. This is... The follow-up to that, to the man that says, hey, I'm fearful, I'm faint-hearted. It says this, let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Now that is extremely powerful. And the reason why is because this. Anyone that is fighting in a battle, and of course we're speaking about the Lord's battle here, but anyone that's going forth and fighting in a war, fighting in a battle, do you know what you want on your side? You want numbers on your side. You want as many people fighting on your behalf as you can possibly get. And you know what he's doing? He's, he's coming up and he's, and he's standing before all the warriors, all the, all the people that are going to be fighting, all the soldiers. And he asks the question, is there anyone here that's afraid? Is there anyone here that is faint hearted? And if somebody says, yes, I am, you know what he tells them? Go home. Go home. We don't want you here. Go home. Do you know the reason why? It says this lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Now this is not even specifically described as a man that's going around and proactively trying to discourage others. That's not even necessarily mentioned here. It is just referring to the fact of a person that is afraid or a person that is faint-hearted or scared is what it's saying. And so just based upon this man's demeanor, if you will, just based upon this man's countenance, if you will, the Lord is afraid or the Lord is, is saying that he doesn't want this man's discouragement or this man's fear to rub off on all the other soldiers. You know what he says? It'd be better if you just went home. Right. It'd be better if you, just, if you just left. You know what that tells you? The great influence that one person has upon another person. The great influence that one soldier or one warrior has upon another person. Now let me say this, and I've said this before, and everyone here is aware of this. This church is not a social club. Right. If that's what you come here for, you've got the wrong church. You might as well go find another church. Right. This is not a fellowship hall or a fellowship event. You know, I don't even like fellowshipping with you. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. So, of course, we fellowship and we enjoy it. We have a fellowship time and the Sunday evening services. But that's not why we meet here. That's not the purpose of why we come here. This church is set up to do the work of God. Amen. This church is set up to battle and fight against evil. That is the reason for this New Testament church here. This church is very different than the majority of churches in the 
Jacksonville area. And that is the difference. Is because we are serious. We are not playing church. We are not playing games. We are here to fight a real battle. And the truth is, as a lot of you know, sometimes it gets very ugly. Sometimes it gets very, you know, uh, spiritually bloody, if you will, right? Not any real blood is shed. But sometimes it can get very dirty. Sometimes you can have your feelings hurt. Sometimes you can be bothered. You know the last thing that we want here? is for one brother. On top of that, on top of going forth into fighting, on top of and in the midst of a real battle going on, one brother to be discouraging another brother. Now if we take the application of the, New of the Old Testament of a physical war and we look at that in a spiritual war how this is basically a military camp here where all the troops are mustered together, they're all gathered together, do you know what would be best for everyone here if you were going around faint-hearted, you were afraid? Let's say that we were in the midst of a real battle. Let's say that we were being attacked by another church. Or let's, say that, you know, let's say that I preached a message that offended some other false religion or some other church or some, some, some group of whoever, homosexuals, whatever, and there's a bunch of people out here or it's all over the news or something like that. You know the last thing? You know the very last thing that, that God would want you to do? And you know what God would say would be best for everyone else here? That if you came here afraid, and if you came here faint-hearted, and if you came here you know, with a bad or poor spirit that would rub off on others, God would tell you to go home. You know why? Because the powerful effect that one brother has on either encouraging or discouraging another brother. Amen. When we are, we're in the New Testament, the battle hasn't stopped. Right. It's just not physical anymore. Right. There is just as much of warfare going on today as there was at the time of David and the time of King Saul. There's just as much evil and wicked. You know, the devil hasn't gone anywhere. Right. Satan hasn't gone anywhere. He's still out there hurting people. He's still out there spreading his false teachings and trying to damn people to hell and destroy people's lives. So churches need to be fighting real battles. And do you know what they have to have if they want to win the fight? They have to have brethren encouraging other brethren. Amen. We don't want the ten spies here. Right. They can go home. Amen. I don't want them here. If people are going to come here during a battle or during a fight and you'll come in and discourage other brethren, we don't want you here. They say go home. God said go home. I want Joshua and Caleb. Amen. I want Joshua and Caleb to come in and tell all the troops and to stand up to all the troops and say, Hey, we can win this fight. Amen. We can win this battle. The Lord is on our side. I want somebody to stand up when we're in the midst of a fight or in the midst of a battle and say, Hey, those people that are attacking our church, they're bred for us. We could eat them alive. They are bred for us. You know why? Because the Lord is on our side. Because God is out on our side. Now the reason why we have strength is not any sort of... I'm not standing up here and boasting in my own might. It's because God will tread down our enemies. It's because the Lord will tread down our enemies. It's because... You know, why are we Valiant Baptist Church? Because the Lord is fighting for us. That's the reason why. That's why we can stand up and that's why we can be encouraged. Now, I want you to think about this. Why was Joshua and Caleb, what was Caleb saying that was encouraging the people? Was he saying, hey, look at our might. Look at all the soldiers that we have. Look at our strength. Look at our military skills. Is that what he was saying? No. He said, the Lord is with us. The Lord is on our side. What were the ten tribes focusing on? Look how big they are. Look how look at the size of them. There is no way that we could physically fight against these people. Look how many there are. Right? So what were they doing? They were walking in the flesh. Those that go around, <coughs> excuse me, discouraging other Christians are fleshly carnal Christians. Right. That's what they are. You know what they're doing? They're walking in the flesh. That's why they're afraid in the first place because they're not trusting in the Lord. Those that are believing in God and putting their faith and their trust in the Lord to fight the battles for them, do you know what they're doing? They're walking in the Spirit. They're not trusting in their own arm. They're not trusting in their own flesh. They're trusting in the might of the Lord. I want you to turn now to Joshua <coughs> chapter number 14. Actually, I'll read you from that. Go to, go to Nehemiah chapter number 2 verse number 18. Nehemiah chapter number 2 verse number 18. 
Joshua chapter number 14, verse number 8. This is Joshua reflecting upon what happened. This was many years after that, around 40 years. Michaela, give me a drink, please. Joshua 14, 8. Joshua speaking. He says this. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. So I want you to notice the two things. Number one, Joshua was giving you the reason why they didn't go forth and, 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 and have the land of Canaan, disinherit those that were dwelling in the land of Canaan 40 years prior to that. He gives you the reason why they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Do you know why? It says, nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. That was the reason why Israel wasn't living in that land 40 years prior to that. That was the reason why Israel was wandering in the wilderness. Why a whole generation of the nation of Israel wasn't able to see the promised land. You know why? Because of 10 men. Because of 10 men causing the hearts of the people to melt. That should show you your influence that you have on everyone in here. I'm positive of this. Now, however much influence you think that you have on everybody in here, it's way more than that. However much influence that you think that you have on every person that's sitting in this room night right now, I can guarantee you that it's more than what you think. Yeah. Ten men were able to influence an entire nation. Ten men. And even, now, whose speech was more powerful? Joshua and Caleb or the ten men? Joshua and Caleb was far more powerful, wasn't it? They, their, their words were much stronger than the ten men. But you know what you had was you had the majority, those ten men. The, the majority of the spies, the ten versus the two, shows the power of each individual within those ten, as opposed to the two. Even when Joshua and Caleb stood up and preached and, and spoke great words for the Lord, there, there was just too many people discouraging the, everyone else. That's what was going on. There was just too many on the side of discouragement to be able to persuade the people. Now, if 10 would have been saying the words that Joshua and Caleb were saying and only two were afraid, what do you think would have happened? They would have went in to the land of, of Canaan. Yeah, I would almost guarantee you they would have went into the land of Canaan. So you know what that shows you? The power of each individual that fell into that, that category of the 10. That shows you the great influence that each individual person has on everyone else in here. Not only on one person, but on everyone else in here. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter number 2, verse number 18 was where I was going to have you turn. Let me get there myself. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter number 2, verse number 18. We'll see the, the, the source, of course, here in just a moment. I'm going to show you something. The source of our strength. Look at Nehemiah 2, verse 17 first. It says, <coughs> Then said I unto them, this is Nehemiah, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words, that he had spoken unto me. And then it says this, And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Now I want you, if you look real close at this verse, where does the strength come from? Ultimately, of course, from God. But where does it come from? You have Nehemiah being strengthened by God, and then Nehemiah brings this message unto the people. While Jerusalem is lying in waste, he comes and he says, then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. <coughs> so he told them this, and it says, as a result of that, and they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Do you know what brought forth as a product of this, the wall being built in Jerusalem? Do you know where that came from? you know where this was brought forth from? Nehemiah's encouragement. Amen. That's where it all began. There was a message from God that was given to Nehemiah and one man went and stood before the nation of Israel and he gave this message and he said, hey, you know, there's been good upon me. The hand of the Lord has been good upon me. This is, this is what he wants me to do and the king has given me permission. Let's do it. And you know what they said? Let's rise up and build. Do you know why? Because of the encouragement of Nehemiah. Once you go to Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 38, go back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 38. 
<clears throat> we're going to see that Moses gave specific instructions for the children of Israel to encourage Joshua as the leader. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 1, <coughs> verse number 38. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 38, it says this, <coughs> But Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. And then watch what it says. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. I want you to go over to just a uh, one chapter or two chapters over. Deuteronomy chapter number 3, verse number 28. Deuteronomy chapter number 3, verse number 28. We're going to see this same thing where there's a, a, a commandment that's given. Hey, encourage Joshua. Encourage the leader. Look at Deuteronomy 3, 28. It says this. But charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him for he shall go over before this people and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see so notice the importance of encouraging in this case the leader but just the importance of encouragement in general God gives specific instructions unto Moses hey I want you to go to Joshua and I want you to encourage him and not only that I want you to tell the people to encourage Joshua you know what he wants them to do he wants them to go to Joshua and tell him something encouraging or go to Joshua and encourage him if you will in the Lord hey we can do this the Lord is with us he wants there to be encouragement why because of the great impact that encouragement has on your brethren I want you to go now with me let's look in uh, the New Testament Luke chapter number 22 verse number 32 Luke chapter number 22 verse number 32 you're gonna see this is a New Testament principle that is taught as well Luke chapter number 22 verse number 32 <clears throat> look at verse 31 first get the context of who he's speaking to it's Peter he says this and the Lord said Simon Simon behold Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not and when thou art converted it's talking about when he denied the Lord of course and then he came back Strengthen thy brethren. And then he goes on and he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. But I want you to notice what the Lord actually told Simon. He said, hey, Satan desires to have you. So you can see what the New Testament battle is still going on there. The, 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 the fight that's happening, that's encouraging, that's uh, incurring still in the New Testament. Just like we saw a battle going on in the Old Testament. But not only that. We see Jesus giving specific instructions to Simon to do what? What did he tell Peter to do? He said, when thou art converted, he said, strengthen thy brethren. Strengthening your brethren is not only an Old Testament principle. It's not only an Old Testament teaching when people are going forth to a physical battle, but it is also a New Testament teaching when we are in a spiritual battle. And that's what's being exactly mentioned here in context. Because what's he talking about? Satan hath desired to have you. He said he wants to sift you like wheat. So there you have the New Testament fight going on. And you see the importance that Jesus wanted Simon afterwards to go forth and to do what? Hey, I want you to go forth and I want you to strengthen your brethren. We as Christians need to look for opportunities to strengthen our brethren. You need to look for opportunities to encourage and strengthen our brethren. Now it goes, it, it, you know, it's left unsaid, it's so obvious that you should be strengthening or encouraging your brethren when we are in a hard time. When someone is going through something hard, you of course need to go to them and I preached this, a, a sermon about this, going to them and helping them and strengthening them in their times of trouble. That's what Christians are for. You need to go to them and show empathy for them. You need to, to, to uh, feel sorry for them, feel bad for them, try to reflect the feelings that they have. You need to go to them and show them that you care for them. Give them strength where? From the Lord, right? You need to strengthen your brother, but not only in times of trouble, not only in times of discouragement of just maybe something bad happens, a relative passes away, 
You need to be strengthening your brethren in the fight. You need to be strengthening your brethren in the battle. Now, what am I referring to? All the different works that we, dif that we do as a church. What's a perfect example? Soul winning. Amen. We have soul winning times. People are going out soul winning constantly. This is the Great Commission. It's the most important job that is given to a Christian in the New Testament. Amen. The last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples was, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every Amen. creature. Those are the, the, the words that Jesus chose to leave his disciples with lastly. The final words. Hey, this is my last commandment. Go preach the gospel to every creature. That's what he wanted to leave them with. You know what that does? It tells you the importance of that, those right. words. That shows you the importance. That's known amongst Christians as the Great Commission. To go out and to get people saved, number one. Then to get them to come to church, get them baptized. Not only that, to disciple them and to teach them as well. That is a fight. That is a battle. Do you know why? Because these people, are, they have, you know, uh, whether it be neighbors or relatives that are trying to pull them away from Christ. Right. The Bible talks about those that, that are saved in 1 John 5, those that believe in God or have put their faith in Jesus, that they are overcoming the world. Why? Because there is a fight or there is a battle that is going on. They may have some neighbor or they may have some relative that is a Jehovah's Witness. They may have someone that's in a false religion. They themselves might have been mixed up in some false religion that is trying to pull them away from, from the truth. You know what you're doing? You're going to their door and you are fighting a spiritual battle is what you're doing. You're going to their, do their door and you're pulling them out of the fire. This is a major part of the fight that goes on in the New Testament. Not only that... It is work to read your Bible. It is work to read your Bible every day. You need to encourage your brethren to read their Bible. I, I have a, a famous line that I've been trying to use again more often. So I've been saying this to everybody. And it's, and it's what is it, Brother Russell? What have you learned? Yeah, yeah. You have, have, you, have you find anything new? That's what it is exactly. You find anything new in your Bible lately? Do you know what I'm, what I'm saying to you? Have you been reading your Bible? Amen. That's the reason why I say that to you. Have you been, it's my way of, of asking you if you've been reading your Bible. But hey, I like to talk about the Bible too. Amen. But you know what I'm doing? I'm asking you if you've been reading your Bible. I'm reminding you. You don't have to tell me per se. But I'm, rem, I'm reminding you, hey, read your Bible. Amen. Because you know what you can't do? You can't find anything new in your Bible if you're not reading your Bible. Right. So it's a reminder, hey, read your Bible. Find your own personal way to encourage your brethren to read their Bible. It is work to read your Bible. And if you have a schedule of reading your Bible every day, you should be well aware that it is work to read your Bible. It is hard to read your Bible every day. Hey, we have life, but that obviously that should be important. We have life and we're busy. It's difficult. But you need to read your Bible. You need to find time. The Bible talks about how it's, it's much study. It's much weariness to the flesh. Study is much weariness to the flesh. The, the, when in the Bible it gives the command in uh, 2 Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, it says this, a workman, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why is he a workman? Because he's studying the word of God. It is work. It is work to study and read your Bible. Encourage your brethren to read their Bible. Encourage your brethren to read their Bible. Encourage your brethren to go soul winning. If someone is not going soul winning, encourage them. Encourage them to go soul winning if someone's not going soul winning. Encourage, you know what you do? Whether you know it or not, you're constantly either encouraging or discouraging people. You know another way to encourage people? Sing the hymns. When we're here, sing loud. You know what you're doing? You are encouraging your brethren. If every single per it's even it's just it's stupid for me to even mention this as a hypothetical because it's so obvious. If every single person in here were to just like barely sing, we're just like like just under their breath, they're just singing. Do you think that that would be encouraging? Do you think everyone would be in here and be saying, "Man, I can feel the spirit of God upon me." Of course not. That's not encouraging. But if every person were to just belt out the singing, if they were to just sing loud and sing unto the Lord, you know how everyone would feel? They would feel encouraged. 
They would feel strengthened. Why do we need to be strengthened? They need to be strengthened. Our hands need to be strengthened. You know why? Because we're here to do work. I'm not saying, I'm not saying, hey, I just want to encourage you to feel, to make you feel good. I'm not Joel Osteen, okay? I'm here to encourage you and to strengthen you to do work. We have real goals. We have a, a real Christianity here, not an empty, vain Christianity. I want to do things for God. I'm not standing up here and just preaching something to you. Hey, I just want you to feel good and then go home. No, I want you to really be encouraged so that you will be encouraged courage and strength and to go forth the battle. I want you to be strengthened so you can trust in the Lord and go forth the battle. Amen. Not only do you need to encourage your brethren by asking them and doing them things, you need to not be discouraging your brethren. Right. You need to not be, and you know how you discourage your brethren? By not going soul winning. Right. That's how you can discourage your brethren. If, if the obvious is, as I said before, everyone goes soul winning, do you think that that's encouraging? If everyone shows up, what about if no one goes soul winning? That's what? Discouraging. So if a person's not going soul winning, do you know what it's doing? It's discouraging their brethren. Whether you know it or not, whether you feel like, hey, I don't have that big of an impact, I don't have that big of an influence, you are discouraging your brethren when you're not going soul winning. You are discour Now, I understand there's life and you have things to do, but we need to have our priorities straight. We need to know what is most important to us, right? We need to find time to serve God, to read the Bible, to go soul winning, to do all of the works of God. That should be our priority. All the things of this life are going to burn away and they're going to be gone. And you're going to be left with an empty nothing is what you're going to have. You're going to be left with an empty life where you did nothing for God. Put your priorities straight. And a person, when you speak to them, and their priorities aren't straight, and they're not living for God, and they're not, you know, uh, you know, they're not walking in the Spirit, and they just, you could just tell, like, hey, their life is not directed in the way of, of importance of, hey, I really want to do something for God. Is it encouraging or discouraging? It's discouraging. But when you really talk to that zealous Christian, that person that's just talking about doing more, that person that's talking about, hey, I read my Bible, I found this yesterday. Hey, I can't wait to go soul winning. Hey, I love to sing the hymns. Hey, this is my favorite hymn. What's your favorite hymn? They just want to talk about God. You know what it does? It encourages. You know who that is? That's Joshua and Caleb. Stop being like the ten, tri the ten spies because that's what you're being. When you are discouraging your brethren, you're acting like the ten spies of the nation of Israel. That's what you're like. You, you have a choice. You can either be Joshua and Caleb, or you can be one of these ten guys over here that no one even remembers their name. Mm -hmm. You know what they did? They came back with no faith. They, had, they came back not trusting in the Lord. They came back, you know what they did? They discouraged their brethren. Now, they verbally did it. They actively did it. But you as a Christian, and you may not be doing it to the full extent that they are, but you as a Christian, you're either encouraging or you are discouraging your brother. You're doing one of the two. You are doing one of the two. Be a Joshua and be a Caleb. Amen. We're fighting a battle. This is not just fun and games. Right. Hey, it's fun serving God. It's fun coming to church. Amen. It's, I have fun preaching. You're right? I enjoy all of it. Every aspect and every bit of it. I love God and I love to have fellowship. But, let me say this, that is not what it is about. If I'm having fun, that, that's irrelevant. The point is to work. The right. point is to get things done. We have things and commandments that are given to us and they need to be accomplished. Amen. And you know what a major part of that is? Encouragement. How important in the army, Brother Russell, is encouragement and, and, and rah rah and, and getting everybody going? Super important, isn't it? Super important. All the men that were in the army, how important is that? Are in the military? So it's critical, isn't it? That's a good way to put it. It's critical. You know what critical means? Deciding factor, basically. Yeah. It's critical. I mean, cr the word critical is basically saying like it, that it's, it's going to go one way or the other. Right. It's critical as in if we don't, we could lose. If we do, we could win. And I, I know this from sports. And I've heard people say this before. I don't, I don't know how, where, they, <laughs> where they get this statistic from, but I've heard in sports that it is night, that, that basketball or just sports in general is 90% mental and 10% physical. Now, I, that statistic sounds ridiculous to me. Number one, you know, uh, tell that to the guy I played one on one. To, no, I'm just kidding. He got two call outs now. But it, it, what I will agree to you is sports is super mental. I mean, it is extremely mental. The very first time that I could dunk a basketball with one hand, I could dunk a basketball every time with one hand. The very first time that I could dunk a basketball with two hands, I could dunk a basketball. I mean, after that, every single time. 
If that's not bizarre to you, look, thinking about that, then I don't know what to explain to you. But you know what that tells you? That I basically could have done that all along mentally if I would have just got it down one, one time while I tried all those hundreds of times. That shows you the impact that just your mind has. Do you know what in sports one of the huge things that people do before a game begins? Everybody, they just right before the very thing, right before the tip off, everybody gathers up into this big crowd. You know what they do? They just hype each other up. That's, right. That's exactly what they do. They just encourage each other. They just yell and scream. And, and you know, there, there's normally a guy that will get in the middle that will basically be the hype man, right? And he'll just start yelling and screaming and, and talking about how we're going to get a victory and we're going to bust them, we're going to beat them. What's the reason? They know the importance of encouragement. They know the importance of making sure that everyone here is encouraged. What if that guy got in the middle and he's like, Boys, I don't think we're going to get a victory tonight. I'm pretty sure they're bigger and better than us. I don't think there's a possibility we could win this game. But just go out there and give it your all. What do you think would happen? They'd lose. It's critical. It's critical to be encouraged. How much more is it, is it, is it important to encourage one another when it matters? And not in some stupid game. Not in some, you know, just some sport that, that has no meaning. That has no value and no one will ever remember that you won that game in 50 years, how much more is it critical for the things of eternity to encourage one another to go soul winning? To encourage one another to maybe get baptized, even new converts. Encourage people to be baptized. Encourage new converts when they come in, hey, I'm glad you're here. I'm thankful that you're here. Encourage people. Give them encouragement. Don't do the opposite. You know, don't be one of the ten spies. Like, hey, you know, <coughs> I'm not even going to say anything. There's many ways where that could go, right? Where you could just, you could, you could discourage people as opposed to encourage people. You know, two ways you need to be encouraging people. Number one, by your own works. By the works that you do. Encourage one another. Encourage others. Right? Encourage your brethren. Strengthen the hands of your brethren by your own works. Not only that, encourage them verbally. Encourage them with your words. Maybe if you're out soul winning and people are, you know, they're, 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 uh, they're afraid in an area that you're in. Maybe they're like, oh man, this is kind of dangerous. You know, it's a new person that's with you or maybe something happened. You can tell that they're, that they're you know, uh, a little bit scared or frightened. <coughs> Say something encouraging to them. Quote to them, you know, uh, uh, maybe the passage in Psalm chapter 34 where it talks about how the Lord, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. Say, hey, we don't have anything to worry about, man. We got, you know, the angel of the Lord encampeth or encamps round about them that Amen. fear him. Amen. You know, we don't have anything to worry about. You know what you'd be doing? Encouraging your brethren. What if you looked at that guy and he's brand new soul and it's like his first time out he's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw that, that guy's got a gun over there. <laughs> yeah, I think we should probably get out of here. How do you think he's going to feel? Better or worse? worse? See the power, when you stop and think about it, the power that just you have and the words that come out of your mouth upon another person. It's critical. I wish I would have used that word from the beginning of the sermon. It's critical. It really is. It's critical. Your, your attitude and your actions and your words are critical in encouraging or discouraging your brethren. It either means... Victory or defeat. Amen. And in the case of the nation of Israel, ten spies meant defeat. Right. It meant they lost the battle. It meant that they went and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. That's what happened. It meant a whole generation of the nation of Israel did not enter into the promised land. Do you know why? The discouragement of ten men. The discouragement of ten spies. A whole generation died. While on top of that, God's saying, I'm going to smite them with the pestilence. I'm going to kill every last one of them. Just rid of them. Moses, I'll leave you alive. And, I, and of you, I'll bring forth the Messiah and the nation of God. And the notion, and then, uh, notion, I don't even know what that, Moses mediates, right? Moses mediates and saves the people, right? Being a picture of Christ. He mediates to him. And he's like, okay, well, then none of, none of this generation that didn't believe in me is going to come in. You know, their children can come in. That's it. 
And, and you know what? They didn't get a second chance because they went and they were like, hey, let's go, let's go. We're ready. They went up to the mountain. They went to go forth to fight. Didn't happen. Didn't work out. They had to flee. You know why? Because the Lord wasn't with them. That's why. That's why. Do you know what, you know what should have happened? They should have been encouraged earlier. You know what that means? You need to encourage your brethren now. You need to encourage them now. Sometimes it can be too late and it can be your fault that you discourage someone. You could get somebody out of church. You could be a discouragement. Let's say you stop going to church. Your participation and your attendance in coming to church encourages everyone else here. What if, what if three quarters of the people didn't, didn't come to church? What if three quarters of the people here, yeah, talk about being critical. When you got 50 people, you know, that's critical. What would happen? to the quarter that was left here. You think they're going to be encouraged or discouraged? They're going to be discouraged. They're going to walk in and they're going to look around and they're going to feel discouraged. People don't show up to soul winning, it's discouraging. People aren't reading their Bible, it's discouraging. When people aren't doing works for God, it is discouraging the brethren. Encourage your brethren. Go to Judges chapter 20, verse number 22. Judges chapter number 20, verse number 22. See this again in light of warfare. <clears throat> Judges chapter number 20, verse number 22. <clears throat> it says in, in, in just this individual verse, it says, And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. Do you know what they did? They encouraged themselves. They stopped. They made a concerted effort. A concerted effort to encourage one another. Again, you see the, the importance of encourage one, encouraging one another. Last passage, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24. <clears throat> we read this recently. It ties in perfectly with... And, and, and this, this was a fight. I'm, my job is not to get along with people. You know, that's, I'm not trying to just get along with everyone. You know, and, you know I, I, I love the people that believe like us. I love them. I want them to... I want to have fellowship with them. I want to, you know, uh, be like-minded in areas with them. But if they're wrong on something, I look at the Bible and they're wrong on something, and they are pushing this and propagating this, that, I will fight against this. Amen. I will battle against this. And one of the things is church. Now, I love all of those people, but if, if someone is actively discouraging people out of church, I'm going to fight you. Amen. Uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? Now, and I don't want people to take this the wrong way, but I don't care if, if, if every last person broke fellowship with this church. As long as I am fighting battles that are biblical, I, then it'll just be us, guys. Yeah. It'll just be us. Amen. We'll have to have a lot of encouragement going on in here. But if every person, even the people maybe that sided with us on other issues, if even maybe the people that were on our side on other issues, you know, were fighting, fighting on, on the side of, of, of evil or fighting on the side of something that is wrong and they are discouraging other brethren and they are propagating something that is hurtful and harmful to the cause of Christ, I'm going to fight against that. Amen. Whether friend or foe, that's irrelevant. The truth is what matters. That's what people don't get sometimes. What matters is the truth. Amen. What matters is... So if someone in here that I loved a lot was like pushing something that's false and harmful to people, I would fight against you. Amen. I would. Now when I say fight, make sure you understand the word fight. Of course you understand I'm not saying physically. But I would battle against that and I would try to shut that down or I would shut that down. If, you are, if you're pushing something false, the Bible doesn't teach it. You could just use the Bible and shut it down, right? And that's what we will do. You, if you see someone else that is discouraging the brethren, you need to call them out. Amen. You need to tell them, hey, quit discouraging your brethren. Amen. You are discouraging your brethren in this area. You are going to cause us to lose a battle. 
You are going to cause us to lose this fight. You are causing other people to be faint-hearted as well. Right. You're causing other people to be afraid and to be, as I said, faint-hearted. Right? To be discouraged. To be dismayed, like the Bible will say. We need to encourage one another. We need to be provoking one another. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, and look what it says, but exhorting, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is the assembling? It's church. Amen. It's coming to church. Do you know where you encourage one another? At, at church. Right. What the word church means, congregation. Do you know when they would encourage one another in the nation of Israel? They were all congregated together. And they would encourage one another. Right? When they're all congregated together, that is a time to encourage one another. You have to come together in order to encourage each other. Right? You have to be together. That's why it says assembling. And you know what, what you need to be doing? This summarizes it perfectly. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. You know what you need to be doing? Encouraging each other unto love, and then it says, and good works. That's why the title of the sermon is Strengthening the Hands of the Brethren. I'm not just here to strengthen your heart. I'm not just here to make you feel good, and make you feel warm and fuzzy. I want to strengthen your hands. I want you to strengthen the hands of your brethren. I want you to strengthen each other's hands. I want you, the whole purpose to encourage each other, is to encourage them and to provoke them unto good works. That's what we should be focused on, encouraging each other to good works. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for all